a few places in the United States. There's also people that don't have time to come to a Friday night service, but they email me, they subscribe to the YouTube channel because they want to join in with Eagle Heart Fellowship on a Friday night. That's good. Amen? Amen? So tonight, three temptations that are common to every man, woman, and child. Now they show up in different ways, but they're three temptations. The three temptations, if you'll turn with me, to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. So the three temptations that are common to every man are the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof leads to death. Another translation says, There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. It began in the Garden of Eden 6,000 years ago with the first Adam. We're going to study tonight the first Adam and the last Adam. Yeah, Adam in the Garden of Eden and Jesus, the last Adam in the Garden of Gethsemane. It starts in a garden, it ends in a garden. We got kicked out of the garden and one gave his life and his life blood in the garden so we could get back to the garden. Amen. Amen? Amen. Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 says, and what are we talking about? Three temptations that are common to who? Everyone. In the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 <coughs> says this, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, say good for food, pleasing to the eye, say pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it, she also gave some to Adam, her husband, who was where? With her. Men, stop blaming the woman for the fall. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> he was where? With her. With, With her, her when she took. The he should have said, uh -huh. woman, no. stop. Back up. I've been given dominion over the Garden of Eden. <laughs> We've been given every tree in the Garden to eat, except that one. That's the tithe tree. We've got to give that one to God. It's holy. Don't mess with that one. We have access to it, but we're not to eat from it. Instead, he watched because he was with her, and then she gave some to him. She's like, oh, that's pretty good. Why don't you try some? He's like, okay. See, men have authority. Women have influence. Sometimes influence is more powerful than authority. She said, hey, eat. He's like, okay. Okay. That's another message. Keep me off rabbit trails, Lord. Right on my mouth. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, which is lust of the flesh. When she saw that it was pleasing to the eye, it was lust of the eye. And when she saw it was also desirable for gaining wisdom, the pride of life is in the Garden of Eden before they fell. Three temptations that are common to every man and every woman. And if these three were wrapped into one tree, the enemy of your soul can break them apart into different things or you can wrap them into one thing. So these are the three things that are common unto every man. If you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, the Apostle Paul said this, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to every man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you 
to be tempted above what you're able to withstand. But with the temptation, he will also make a way for you to escape that you might be able to bear up underneath it. So never say that, well, I didn't have the strength or it was too overwhelming for me because the scripture says there's no temptation that's taken you except that which is common to every one. And with the temptation, he always makes a way to escape. Joseph, Potiphar's wife, she's in the bedroom, calls him in. He's like, yes, he's trying to submit to authority. She's like, come lie with me. Come into the bedroom with me. The master's away. He's like, no, I cannot do this wicked thing to sin against your master and sin against God. He's entrusting me with the whole house. She tries to pull him in. He literally has a way of escape. Hallelujah. It means leaving his robe behind. Definitely. You have not yet resisted unto bloodshed. Jesus talked about. He endured the cross despising the shame. Are you willing to leave your garment behind and be accused of a rapist mm -hmm. instead of taking your garment off and laying it aside and going in and yielding to the temptation? There's no temptation that is taking you except that which is common to every man. Ecclesiastes 1.9 says there's nothing new under the sun. What's been before shall be again. All the things that are written aforetime, uh, Romans 15, 4, were written for our learning mm -hmm. so that we might have hope. Let me share this with you. The power to overcome the temptation always comes before. And if you'll yield to the power, you'll stand against it. Amen. If you'll yield to the temptation, you'll slip into it. Mm -hmm. The power to overcome temptation always rises up within you because there's no temptation that's taking you except that which is common to every man. And with the temptation, he always makes a way. He'll strengthen you. He'll give you an avenue. And yeah. If you'll look for it. If not, you'll fall into it. Fall into it. It's always a choice. Jesus, the last Adam, overcame the three common temptations in the wilderness with the tempter Satan. If you'll turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're an overcomer. You're an overcomer. I see it in you. I see it in me. That's right. I see it in me. Because greater is he in you than he that's within the world. There is no temptation that's taking you except that which is common unto every man. And when the temptation comes, you just say, oh, that's a common temptation. Hallelujah. That ain't nothing. Got anything bigger than that? Right. And he'll set some book for you, trust me. <laughs> every new level, there's a new level of devil. Amen. Remember the things that used to trip you up? You're like, miss me with that. Uh, oh, that's an old game. I've seen that before. Come on. That's, 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 that was third grade. Yeah, you know. And then you look at other people that are caught up in the, the, the strife and the big and this and that, and you're like, get over with that. And they're like, what do you mean? You don't know what he did to me. You don't know what she said. I'm like, really? You know, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, an adult, I put away childish things. People will say something like, I'm like, you, you don't see that? That's a setup. What do you mean? Well, the reason I know it's a setup because I fell prey to that one nine years ago. But I learned from it. There was a man I heard one say, I never make the same mistake twice. He says, it's normally three or four times before I figure it out. <laughs> and I think that's scriptural at times because the Bible says, though the righteous man falls seven times, he gets up again. And here's another saying, shame me once, or fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So God's got to break this shame off of us so we don't fall prey to it anymore. Yeah. Jesus, the last Adam, Adam, the first Adam, Jesus overcame the three common temptations in the wilderness with the tempter, Satan. Notice this. Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, he's just had water baptism, the Holy Spirit descends on him in bodily form like a dove, a voice speaks from heaven. The Father's voice says, This 
is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Immediately, the Spirit of the Lord that just descended upon him drove him into the wilderness for a 40-day fast, and in those days, he ate nothing. Do you know you can be tempted when you're fasting when you should be strongest? Luke 4, 1 says he was full of the Holy Spirit, and after a 40-day fast, verse 14 says he returned in the power Amen. of the Spirit. That's right. You can be filled with the Spirit and not have That's right. the power of the Spirit. You can pray for people when you're full of the Spirit and you'll see some stuff happen. But when you're released in the power, you know. you'll see all kinds of things happen. Right. Amen. Amen. You can't imagine it not happening That's right. when you start to pray for the sick and demons start to manifest because you've been released in the power because you've overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony and you love not your life, your desires of the old nature, even unto death, they fall to the side. Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Oh, Lord, fill us with the power. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Is it God's will to heal all? My Bible says yes. Why isn't it happening? Because we haven't been released in the power. Stop blaming God. Stop making theological excuses. Stop misinterpreting the word and ignoring things and taking a razor blade spiritually and cutting things out of the Bible that are the promises of God and saying God doesn't work that way anymore. He works the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't blame God for your powerlessness. Amen. 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 Matthew 4.1 and then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Say hungry. Hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread, lust of the flesh. You ever lust after food? Scripture says that the Passover feast, Jesus earnestly desired to eat it. You know what the word is in the original Greek? It's lust. Lust is not a bad thing no, no. if it's in line with an uh, earnestly desire. Earnestly desire the greater gifts, but there's a bad lust. And it's the lust that is outside the will and the timing of God. There was nothing wrong with the bread. No. Mm -hmm. Forty days you deserve a piece of bread. But it wasn't yet the timing for him to eat it. Okay. It was in the wrong way, in the wrong timing. One of the temptations that will come to you that the enemy will try to trip you up with, it will be in the wrong way and the wrong timing. Mm -hmm. And it's not a bad thing, but it's not a God thing. Mm -hmm. You can have a good thing that's not a God thing. And so what happens with the enemy, the scrutinizer is what the tempter is. He's a scrutinizer. He's an enticer. He's also a discipliner in the original Greek. So when the enticer comes, the tempter the discipliner, the scrutinizer, the one who comes to examine you to see if you have anything in common. Mm -hmm. Woo! Mm -hmm. Pluck on your strings mm -hmm. to get a response from you, to get you out of the arena of faith. That's it, that's Where it. Where he loses every time and get you into the arena of reason. Jesus said this in John 14, 30 and 31. He said, the prince of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. We don't have anything in common. That's right. No. You know why the enemy gets us? Because we got something in common with him. That's it. That's it right there. You know why? You know why Jezebel got you? Delilah got you? Or something's still in you. Mm -hmm. Don't blame her. Don't blame him. It's in you. When you squeeze an orange, what do you get out? Orange juice. Not necessarily you get out of the orange, whatever is in it. It could be a worm, it could be sour juice. Stop blaming the squeezer mm. for what's in you. Mm. Thank God for them for revealing what's in you. So you get it to the cross, That's it. and he can turn the bitter waters back to sweet. Your problem is not the enemy. Your problem is you, and my problem is me. The biggest problem you will ever have in life is not your spouse. It's not, it's not the devil. It is you. 
Woo! And when you'll overcome that which is within, the things on the outside, you won't have any problem with. And when you do, you'll be in the arena of faith and walk in victory. The first temptation is the lust of the flesh here, and it's one of the types of temptations that is a normal temptation, but it's in the wrong timing and the wrong way. The second temptation that comes to Jesus, the first one's lust of the flesh, tell these stones, verse 3, to be made bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Verse 5, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. It's like 700 feet off a cliff at that time. And so he's 700 feet in the air and he's looking over. And this is what the devil said. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, God will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so that you do not strike your foot against a stone. He's saying, look, Jesus, if you're really the son of God, do something supernatural. Why don't you do something and all the people will follow after you? Let's get this show on the road, hero. If you're really in, why don't you just go ahead and step off that 700 foot cliff and watch the angels grab it. All the people will see you float on down. Say, I am the son of God. I've come to save people from their sins. And this miracle feat that I've just done confirms it. Follow me. What does Jesus say? Jesus answered him. Verse 7. It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. <laughs> Notice how the devil attacked him based on his experience. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him, the devil. If you're the son of God. Jesus never fought the devil based on his experience. Hmm. Well, I'm back at the, 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 the pool. I mean, I, I, you, did, you, did you hear the voice? Look at all the witnesses. I mean, I, the, the voice said I'm the son of God. Don't you know? Devil, don't you know? You didn't have to tell him that. No. The devil didn't, the, Jesus did not fight the devil based upon his experience. He bought, fought him based upon the word. Never fight the enemy based upon your experience. Mm -hmm. Fighting based upon the word. And he quoted from Deuteronomy three separate times to overcome the enemy. Yeah. Tell me that the Old Testament's not important. Yeah, it is. Very important. Yeah, it is. Amen? The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament's the Old Testament revealed. revealed. We need both. So the second test is the pride of life. Do something sensational. Don't you want to be seen? Woo! The great swelling of pride. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And the devil said, all this will I give to you. Remember this, he had it to give it. He was the prince of the power of the air. He was the god of this world because he <clears throat> tricked Adam out of his inheritance. He owned it. Yeah. And he said, look, Jesus, you don't have to go to the cross. I got a shortcut for you. Let me give you plan B. Now, I realize you're God in the flesh, and without you, nothing was made, and by you, all things consist, and you uphold all things by the word of your power. And I realize the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is the creator that created even me. But in this situation, I'd really like the creator to bow down and worship the creation. Could you just do that? <laughs> That's how brazen the enemy is. He will try to trick you out of your inheritance in your flesh. All this I will give you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. All of this. All that you see with your eyes. The lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes. And the pride of life. Is not of the Father, but of the world. And this is what the enemy says in his third type of temptation. Look, you don't have to go. To the garden of Gethsemane. You don't have to go to the cross. Let me show you a shortcut to what God promised you. I'll give you everything God promised you if you just do it my way. You know why I ended up with a 22 year prison sentence in the feds? Because I had a calling on my life. And the enemy tempted me. And he showed me everything that God had promised me. 
if I just do it his way. And I fell prey to that temptation. And it was fool's gold. The only shortcut there is in the kingdom is the shortcut to the cross. Amen. And it begins the long road Amen. from there. Amen. Salvation is instant and it's free. Amen. Amen. Sanctification is a lifelong process. Amen. Salvation is free, but the anointing will cost you everything. That's right. Amen. Amen. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me, lust of the eye. Jesus said unto him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and the angels attended him. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Three common temptations that are common to every man, woman, and child. And with the temptation, he always makes a way of escape. Let no man say when he's tempted, he's tempted of God. For God tempts no man. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own desire. I see it right there. And when desire is conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin bringeth forth death. There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. David, where's the good news? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. Do you remember a story in the book of Judges with a guy by the name of Samson and Delilah? The hairdresser. <laughs> she got her cosmetology license from the Philistine school. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Judges chapter 16, verses 1. Now Samson went to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went in under her. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying in the morning, when it is daylight, we will... Bless him with the keys to the city. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. It says, when it is daylight, we will kill him. Say, kill him. Kill him. Yeah. Verse 3, and Samson lay low till midnight. Then he arose at midnight and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two gate posts, pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. A little hermeneutics. <laughs> Science of biblical interpretation, dealing with geography, chronology, culture, history of events. The gate weighed 2,200 pounds. Hebron, facing Gaza, was 38 miles away, farther than a marathon. And Samson, fresh out of the bed with a harp. You know, when you're most anointed. Most. Most holy. <laughs> so you can have a calling on your life and don't be deceived you can have a calling on your life have the anointing on you mess around the enemy will try to kill you and the call will keep you safe but don't be deceived judgment will come if you don't repent because the calling the priestly garment will keep you under the anointing even though you're not right the garment will protect you it's not a pass card it's grace to repent and get back right. Let me tell you why. Aaron, when Moses is up on the mountain, Aaron is wearing the ephod. And what's he doing? He's got a golden calf. And the people are worshiping a golden calf, saying, this are the, this, these are the gods that brought us out out of Egypt. You would think he'd be struck dead, but he wasn't because he's wearing the garment. He's got the mantle. Once you've been anointed, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Mm. That's true. Oh, but you will give an account on the day of judgment for the deeds that you did in the flesh. I have a friend of mine pastoring 1,500 members, three separate congregations on simulcast. I won't tell you the things that have come out that he was doing while he was leading people to Christ. Mm -hmm. An incredible apologetics anointing and did over a half a billion dollars in fraud. He's sitting in federal prison now. Yeah, yeah. And if I told you the things that are coming out that he did while he was in the pulpit leading people to Christ because 
he had the priestly garment on, the anointing. I'm not talking about the physical priestly yeah, 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 yeah. garment. Yeah. I'm talking about the spiritual one that you don't get in the schools of men. You don't get it at the seminary or the cemetery. You get it because God calls you, he anoints you, and he appoints you. And the gifts and the calling of God, Romans 11, 29, are irrevocable. They're without repentance. What are you going to do with the gift? God gave you yes. because the gift is not to you as much as it is through you yes. to others. Yes, yes, yes. Man, that's it. Wow. And now he sits in a prison cell. And let me tell you something. <clears throat> the biggest revival in the history of that prison is happening right now because the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember Jonah? He's in total rebellion against God. Ends up in the belly of a fish. Mm -hmm. He repents in hell. He lifted up his eyes. Three days in the heart of the earth. Jesus was, even as Jonah, was three days and nights in the belly of the giant fish. He repents. God vomits him up on the beach through the, the whale. And if you know anything about people that have been inside of whales, it's about 103 to 105 degrees inside the whale's belly. There's air in there. You can actually breathe and survive. They actually, whaler ships have caught whales, cut them open, and somebody who fell overboard had been inside the whale and still alive. <clears throat> and all the hair is eaten off of their body. All the melon is removed from their skin. They look like a ghost. They're hairless. They look like Casper the friendly ghost when they come out. <laughs> Can you imagine Jonah being vomited up on the beach by a whale who slides up, slides back in and swims off, and Jonah comes out completely naked, hairless, white as a ghost, and he's yelling, Repent! For 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed! Is that pain? A picture yeah. of maybe why they yeah. responded? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Where were you? I rebelled against the Lord. They threw me overboard, and I ended up in the belly of a fish. You can't. Well, no, well, I guess you could. <laughs> I repented. I was in hell. My yeah, God. Jesus. And he caused the giant fish to spit me up on the beach. Jesus. Here, take a toga. Put it on. And it says that the three-day walk through Nineveh, Jonah was able to do it in a single day. That's some quick preaching. And there wasn't a lot of apologetics arguments. There wasn't a lot of opposition. And the whole city goes on a three-day fast. Not even the animals ate or drank. The goldfish in... They didn't even get fed. 120,000 people repent. Do you know why? Not because Jonah is so righteous but because he has the gift of God. Yeah, yeah. He has the mantle. He has the anointing. And you'll either get your job done by assignment of the Lord, by obedience, and experience storms of correction in the process, like Jonah got, and he spits you back on the beach. Let me rephrase that. Either storms of perfection, like Paul got in Acts 27, when he was going to Rome. He's a prisoner with 276 people. He's there by righteousness and a storm of perfection to perfect him to the next level game to purify him. Mm -hmm. Or you'll get it out of rebellion through a storm of correction. My God. Either way, let me tell you what happens. The storm of correction when you repent spits you up on the beach and revival happens because of the gift. Mm -hmm. The gift of God in you. Mm -hmm. And remember, the gift is not for you as much as it is, is through. through you. Absolutely. Right. Remember that. Your gift of mercy or giving or teaching or preaching or hospitality, even though you gain the benefit of it as well, right. it's not to you as much as it is through, through you Absolutely. unto others because God didn't die for buildings. He died for people. Amen. He died on the cross to redeem mankind. Your gifts are to strengthen and to redeem and to heal and to set others free. Because they're gifts given through you unto others. Amen. The vessel may not always drive right, but the engine is there. You can use it for His glory. You can use it for your glory. You look at some of the wonderfully gifted singers in society. It started in the church. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, but because of the gold or the glory, 
or the girls, mm -hmm. or the guys, Come on now. or for the power, the prestige, or the position. They said, I'll guide my gift, and I'll bow down mm. and worship you. Ooh. Just give me that microphone and the stage. Mm. Ooh, my God. I don't care what I have to do. I love the praise of men my God. more than the praise of God. My God. Whom do you seek to please, God or men? If I was still seeking to please men, I would not be a bond servant of yeah. the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Galatians 1, 10 and 11, yeah. the Apostle Paul scribed those words to the church of Galatia with his first century pen. Yes. Do you know what a bond servant is? A bond servant is a slave that served his time seven years, and it's time for him to go free. free. Mm -hmm. And he says... No, I want to willingly serve for the rest of my life in this master's house. I want to serve you, Lord. Put an awl in my ear so people will know that I'm not a slave. I'm a bondservant by choice. I'm not a hireling. I'm a son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Samson went down to Gaza, and he saw a harlot there, and he went in under her. When the Gazites were told, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate of the city. They were quiet all night, saying, In the morning, when daylight has come, we will kill him. And Samson lay low till midnight. Then he rose up at midnight, took the doors of the 2,200-pound gate of the city and the two gateposts, and pulled them up, bar and all, put them on his shoulders, and carried them 38 miles away to the hill that faces Hebron. Now, let me ask you a question. If you had just sinned and violated your covenant with God and went into a harlot and realized that the door opened for judgment and then God's anointing came on you and delivered you out of the situation in spite of, what would you do in response? God, I have sinned. Thank you for delivering me. You are so merciful. Thank you. I will never do that again. You and your mercy set me free. Mm -hmm. I was a dead man in a harlot's house. Mm -hmm. Verse 4, afterward it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah the hairdresser. <laughs> now she's not a Jew. Mm -hmm. The point is, you don't marry outside your kind, not because of ethnicity, mm -hmm. color, creed, but because of belief in God. He served the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She served the God of the Philistines, which was a completely different God. And the Bible says you're not to be un unequally yoked together with a non-believer. Yet, after that incident, he does what? He goes in and he puts his head in the lap of Delilah. Symbolic of the world. And the lords of the Philistine came unto her and said unto her, Entice him and find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may empower, overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver. Notice it doesn't just say 1,100 pieces of silver. It says every one of us. That's a lot of bank, brother. Bank. She's going after the gold, isn't she? Yeah. She's tempted. <laughs> See, a thousand Philistine lords... Warriors could not bind Samson. He was unstoppable. But one woman could. Woo! There's no temptation that has taken you except that which is common unto every man. And with the temptation, he always gives you strength to walk away. He always makes an avenue for you to run even if you lose your garment in the process. He always makes a way because greater is he that's in you than he that's within the world. He'll warn you in a dream. You'll have the butterflies in your stomach. You'll have a sick feeling. You'll say, something's wrong. I need to go the other direction. Flee, Timothy, flee. Run, Joseph, run. Amen. And you may need to get away from some men. Or some business deals or some religious people mm, mm. that are hindering you with the temptation of prideful religion. Amen. Amen. As we know the story, and we're not going to go into it, Judges 16, verses 1 through 31, here's what happened. Mm -mm -mm. 
The third time, she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head, which was the secret to his strength, which he disclosed to her because she was selling him out like a Judas yeah. for the silver. Yeah. And the, she, she began to torment him, and his strength left him, and she said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke out of his sleep, verse 20, and said, I will go out as before, as at other times, and shake myself. But he wist not, or he knew not, that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes, and brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze feathers, and became, he became a grinder in the prison. Let me tell you something. Samson lost several things that day. He lost his position as judge over Israel. He lost the presence of God, which is the primary thing. He lost the power of God. Sin will take you farther than you planned on going. It will cause you to spend more than you planned on spending and will keep you there longer than you planned on staying. Amen. It will take you farther than you planned on going, will keep you there longer than you planned on staying, and will cost you more than you ever planned on spending. Amen. The two, this is the saddest verse in the Bible for me. Judges 16.20. I will go out as before, just like at other times. I'm going to trust in my gifting mm -hmm. instead of the Lord. Mm -hmm. I'm going to trust in my anointing instead of my relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm going to trust in what I know with history with God, mm -hmm. that he's forgiven me before, and because I've got on the priestly garment, the holy ephod, I'm covered even though I'm deep in sin. But I'm a playmaker, so it's okay. Woo. You may be a playmaker, but it's never okay. As my friend sits in federal prison right now, and the gift is still operating in him, and I'll guarantee you, he's miserable. But like Jonah, he ended up spit out of the belly of the fish and into the federal prison. And even though there's a revival, because you can't help but preach. It's like a fire shut up in your bones. Yeah, yeah. You may lose all the reward for it. None of your righteousness may be remembered. If you walk in righteousness and fall, none of your righteousness will be remembered. And if you walk in wickedness and you fall at the cross and you rise again, none of your wickedness will be remembered. Mm -hmm. hmm. It's best to end right. That's right. Amen. And not to end bad. Amen. Is this helpful at all? Yes. 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 But here's the word. But he wist not, King James, NIV, but he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. The, the word wist not in the Old Testament is only used twice in relation to the Spirit of God or the glory of God. Okay. Wow. Okay. It's used with Samson that he wist not that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. And it's dealing with Moses, that when he came down off the mountain and the glory of God shined off his face, he wist not or knew not that his face glowed with the glory of God. Okay. Okay. So here's the illustration. Moses is so caught up in the greater glory, mm -hmm. the sun that saturates him, mm -hmm. the light of God mm -hmm. on the mountain, that he's so caught up in God that when he leaves God's presence, all he can think of is him. Monica. And he's reflecting the glory. Have you ever seen somebody out in the sunshine for several hours one day? Mm -hmm. And they come back in and they're just glowing. Red. They're red, they're glowing. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine being in the presence of Almighty my God, God? God? The light of the world for 40 days mm -hmm. on a fast, caught up in his presence, receiving not just the Ten Commandments, but the 16, 613 Levitical laws at his hand. And you're coming down. Yes. And as you're coming down, the people see the glory shining off your face. But you're so caught up in him that you don't even know you reflect his glory. Moses wist not, he knew not that the spirit of the Lord, the glory of God, shined off of his face. Great extreme. He was so lost in God. 
Samson, on the other hand, was so lost in the lap of Delilah, symbolic of the world, that he wist not or knew not that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. Where are you at today? Woo! Your ability to overcome temptation is rooted in what you really love. That's it, that's it. Jesus or the world. There's no temptation that's taken you except that which is common unto every man. And with the temptation, he always makes a way of escape. Mm -hmm. Who are you beholding? Wow. We are changed into the image and likeness mm -hmm. of his son. From glory to glory. Mm -hmm. As we behold mm -hmm. him. Hallelujah. We're changed into the image and likeness of the world. Yeah, yeah. As we behold it. Mm -hmm. Most of us are somewhere in between, if we were honest. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you like to be sold out? Hallelujah. And when you leave his presence and you walk into someone else's presence, all they see is him yeah. reflecting off of you. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. There's no greater compliment yes. than people who see Jesus Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. There are five gates that the enemy enters through. Let's look briefly into the story of the Trojan horse from Greek mythology to gain an insight into the strategy of the devil and his demons. The Greek siege of Troy had lasted for ten years. The Greeks devised a new ruse, a giant hollow wooden horse. It was built by Epius and filled with Greek warriors led by Odysseus. Pronounce that one. Mm -hmm. The rest of the Greek army appeared to leave, but actually hid themselves inside the horse. Mm -hmm. The rest of the Greek army appeared to leave, but some actually hid themselves inside the horse. Meanwhile, a Greek spy convinced the Trojans that the horse was a gift, mm -hmm. despite the warnings of priests and soothsayers. In the end, the Trojans foolishly, say foolishly, foolishly. accepted their enemy's gift. Mm -hmm. They opened the gates of the city. They brought the horse in and shut the gates. The Trojans celebrated at the end of the siege so that when the Greeks emerged from the horse, the city was in a drunken stupor. The Gre you know, sometimes we celebrate in the end zone before the game is over. We got to stop it. <laughs> One touchdown and you think the game's over. <laughs> There's a second half. Amen. I don't care how many points the enemy scored, there's a second half. Amen. And the God of the trump card, the God that trumps over your enemies, wants to come in in the 11th hour and turn things around. Mm -hmm. The Greek warriors opened the city gates to allow the rest of the army to enter, and the city was pillaged ruthlessly. All the men were killed, and the women and children were taken into slavery. As we can see from the story above, the enemy was able to enter the otherwise impenetrable city walls of Troy by simply offering the gift of the beautiful Trojan horse. Our nation has had a Trojan horse offered to us in entitlements. That's another message. But we have willingly given away our rights to democracy and yielded to the gifts of entitlements that's another message. Mm -hmm. Instead of waging war to get inside the city, the crafty Greeks simply set a gift outside the front gate. The Trojans, desirous of the gift, then opened their own gates and brought the giant horse inside their domain, then celebrated and fell into a drunken stupor. While they were sleeping, the hidden enemy inside the horse kicked open the secret door, overcame the guards, and opened all the gates to the city for the other Greek soldiers to enter Troy and capture the entire city all through the sly offer of what appeared to be a free, a free gift. The devil's schemes are like that mm -hmm. of the Greek's Trojan horse. Mm -hmm. For some of it, for some of us, it's the attractive Trojan horse of making quick money. Mm -hmm. This cost Judas his eternal soul for 30 pieces of silver. Matthew 27, verses 3 through 9. For others, it's the enemy's offer of sex with a woman, 
Samson fell prey and his head landed squarely in the lap of Delilah, the Philistine hairdresser. He lost his seven locks of hair, his strength, his freedom, his eyes, and eventually his life as he died in prison. David fell prey to Bathsheba and then committed murder to cover it up in 2 Samuel 11, verses 1 through 27. All because he didn't protect his spiritual gates from temptation. For there's no temptation that is taken you except that which is common unto every man. David didn't lose his kingship, but how many people lost their lives in a plague because of it? 70,000 because of his one act. I'm the king. I can do this. Don't think your position of authority gives you the right to do it when it's contrary to this book. That's right, that's right. Don't think because you're wearing the linen ephod that just because you can get away with it for a season that it's okay. Don't get into the sin of presumption presuming that just because you weren't judged that God is okay with it and he's winking at yours or that thing that you preach applies to everybody but you. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you something else. If while you're listening to this message, you're thinking of other people, mm -hmm. repent. Amen. Amen. Yes. That's right. That's right. Amen. It's not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord. <laughs> Amen. 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 God strengthen us. <laughs> All because David didn't protect his spiritual gates from temptation. What is the Trojan horse the enemy uses with you? Is it alcohol, drugs, pornography? Has the devil placed these things outside your spiritual gates lately? Maybe it's money? Remember when you invite these things into your city, the enemy comes with the things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. My God. Let's look at an all too common example of how the enemy works in the <laughs> Christian's life. Because there's no temptation that's taken you except that which is common in every man with the temptation. He always makes a way of escape that you might be able to bear up underneath it. But remember, the enemy doesn't have any new weapons in 6,000 years. Mm -hmm. They're just wrapped differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are not ignorant of the enemy's device, 2 Corinthians 2.11. He sets before the gates of the blood-washed Christian a beautiful woman or an attractive, handsome man. Mm -hmm. The Christian peers at her through his eye gate. Five gates of men, they're the five sentences. The eye gate, the ear gate, the mouth gate, the nose gate, and the touch gate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. She is pleasing to the eye. Her perfume arouses him. Or his cologne draws her. This is gender neutral teaching. <laughs> Do you know that women are starting to creep up with a pornography problem at the level of men now? I know. It's, 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 it's starting. Women are climbing in our nation into the pornography problem. And men, have, or which are more visual, normally have this problem more than women. And, and here's an interesting statistic. One out of seven pastors went to a pornographic website more than once this week and intended to go there. And then got in the pulpit and preached. Oh my God. One out of seven. Wow. Some statistics are one out of four. Wow. You know, by the grace of God, I don't have that stronghold. I don't understand it. But I have compassion for those who do. that do. Amen. Amen. And I stand with them Amen. as God delivers them. And I've seen God deliver Amen. people from that. Amen. It's normally a soul woman. Mm. But she's pleasing to the eye. Her perfume arouses him through his nose gate. They engage in conversation. Her words are smooth and soothing to his soul as he or she listens to him. Or as he listens to her, it's gender neutral. Place yourself in the story so that you can overcome and not fall prey to. Mm -hmm. Her words are smooth and soothing to his soul as he listens attentively through his ear gate. Mm -hmm. The thought of going to dinner with her sounds appealing. Dinner is safe enough, he thinks to himself. Why not? It's, like, it's not like I'm sleeping with her. I just want to get to know her better. Besides, she may be sent to me by God. <laughs> yeah, but she's not saved. Don't be unequally yoked together with the non-believer. But I might win her to Christ. Yeah. <laughs> Missionary dating. No, 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 no. No. Preach. Send somebody to get her to church. Yeah. Then once she gets saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost and has a maturity level that's equal with yours. Yeah. Now the two of you 
can walk in holy matrimony. Amen. Because if you get one that is born again, but her level of maturity is not yours. Yeah. The enemy will attack her to get to you. Yeah, and right. woman of God, if he just got saved, don't try to save him oh, by oh. marrying him. That's right. Find somebody who's spiritually mature as you are, or the enemy will use him to try to kill you yes. and destroy your oh, ministry. Be not unequally yoked Amen. together, not just with non-believers, but those that are not. I'm talking about when you're yoked as two yoke of oxen together, yeah. you both have to pull that load. Right. And if you've got one that keeps running off, yeah. you still got to pull the load and you got to fight the other one. Yeah. 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 That'll wear you out. Yeah. That'll give you some sleepless nights. Yeah. Mm. Dinner's safe enough, he thinks to himself. Why not? I not like I'm sleeping with her. I just want to get to know her better. Besides, she may be sent to me by God to be my wife. He asks her to dinner. She responds while waiting for their food. She orders a glass of wine. He says, I'll take one, two. One oh. glass won't hurt. And then it's two. As glass after glass enters through the mouth gate, his senses begin to dull and his tie begins to loosen. He begins to forget the advice of King Lemuel's mother in Proverbs. Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes to drink strong drink, lest they forget the law of God and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Proverbs 31, verses 3 through 5. And if you read on, you'll find the Proverbs 31 woman. That is depicted in her character traits and attributes as a godly woman. As they get up to leave, she help, he helps her with her coat. He wants to be a gentleman. As she slips it over her shoulders, he feels something as they make contact for just a moment. Mm -hmm. The touch gate uh -oh. uh -huh. has now been affected. Uh -oh. He is aroused. A kiss follows, then passion runs wild, the two become one flesh, and the enemy has ridden in undetected on this seductive filly of the night. The following morning, the Christian tries to repent for his actions, but something seems to hinder him. His desire to read the Bible doesn't seem to be present. His prayers are now hollow. God's presence seems withdrawn. The heavens, unhearing and silent, later a phone call comes his way, it's her. She wants to thank him for such a wonderful evening. Mm. Can they go out again? Mm. He pauses, remembers the passion, and yields again. The next thing he knows, it's been several months' time. Church has been on the back burner. His friends have again become those of the world. All five of his gates are now open to the enemy. His eye gate, his ear gate, his mouth gate, his nose gate, and his touch gate. Mm -hmm. And the level of the world's influence in his life is increasing, although he doesn't know it. Jesus. And the soul tie that he has Jesus. opens him up yeah. to demonic bondage, yeah. even though he's born again. Yeah. That's it, that's it. He's been too preoccupied with the woman, making ends meet financially, and the enemy now has him. For some, it can result in going back to Egypt. For others, they came out of prison and got caught up. It can be going back to prison. Mm -hmm or a dirty urine sample because of the activity that's involved mm -hmm. and the old strongholds reactivated. Wow. Others will commit a new crime mm. to keep that high maintenance woman in proper attire. Okay. Because she looks good on the arm. Mm -hmm. so. hmm. Or maybe it's several women by now mm. because demons don't come alone. A friend of mine, 27 years in the ministry, never committed adultery on his wife, was married as a virgin, and he got tripped up with adultery. He got on the plane to come home, never drank in his life, never drank, smoked or chewed, didn't go with girls to do. The, the stewardess came over in first class, would you like something to drink, sir? He's like, I'm so twisted over what had happened. He's like, I, uh, I, uh, give me whatever he's got. She says, and he named it, he didn't know what it was. He said, well, Okay, give me, she says, do you want a double? Go, okay, whatever it is. He went from an act of adultery to now he's drinking. Mm -hmm. He gets home. And God, because he has a priestly garment on, mm. insulates him. And he's still got the anointing. He preaches on Sunday, the sick get healed. 
People are filled with the Holy Spirit. Devils cast out. People get saved. Okay. He goes into his office broken before the Lord. God, what has happened? What has happened? He flies back out because he's in the marketplace and the ministry. Mm -hmm. And while he's out, he happens to be in business in Vegas. Somebody introduces him to Blackjack. And he starts winning. He says, David, in seven days, I picked up three addictions. Jesus. Women, wine, and gambling. Yeah. Just that quick. 27 years. He said, because I had the priestly garment on, God allowed me to continue. But when judgment fell, I ended up in a white-collar crime. I got the stiffest sentence in the history of that state. 700 years. Oh, wow. When judgment fall, he who being often reproved yet hardeneth his neck will be destroyed suddenly and not without remedy. And I might say this. It wasn't a one-time act with him and it wasn't the same woman. It was now a string of activities. He began to run through a slew of them. And everywhere he went, this man weighed 500 pounds. Jeff knows the man. Man, he could preach like his shirt tail was on fire. And he said, David, be careful. That's why we need prayer when we go into the street. A thousand Philistines couldn't bind Samson, but one woman could. We're closing. <clears throat> oh, what a tangled web we weave. A dozen of the 17 works of the flesh are now in full manifestation. When we've given the devil permission to take us captive at his will, 2 Timothy 2.26, for although we're born-again Christians, our actions indicate we have once again become what the Bible says are the children of disobedience by our actions, Ephesians 2.2 2 and 3. We have, in effect, given place to the devil. Every one of us has a shield or a hedge of protection when we're born again. We have to either kick a hole in the shield to go out, and grab something, mm -hmm. Ecclesiastes 10.8, he who kicks a hole in a hedge, a serpent will come through and bite him. Ecclesiastes 10.8 is King James Version. Or, something shows up. Pizza, man. Pizza, I know pizza. Look out that door. Looks like pizza. What is that? We open the door, land shark. <laughs> I've had ministers tell me some stories in the most 